Okay, please go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for, for the introduction. So yeah, today I'm going to be speaking about uh, our control systems at IBM, as well as our uh, system software that orchestrates these control systems, and, and really kind of giving an overview of, of the layer that I think is often hidden uh, from, from the end user. We, we think a lot about the programming we do in Qiskit and the programs we send and put a lot of effort into explaining that. We also, there's a lot of content talking about the qubit chips. Well, I know we've all seen the pictures of the big dilution refrigerators in the systems, uh, but really these are in a sense passive devices and, and it's a lot of software and, and very complex control systems and computer architecture for those control systems that put, makes us all work. And so I'm going to kind of uh, be speaking about that hidden layer, I think, today, which it, which is fun. It, it's maybe a bit different than uh, many of the talks that, that uh, we, we go through. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I want to plug uh, the Spring Challenge for Qiskit right now. Uh, so, so the IBM uh, Spring Challenge started yesterday, but I think you can still sign up. They just started Lab 2 today. And what's really relevant to this talk is that it's being based on dynamic circuits, which is what I've spent the last year or two of my life uh, working on and uh, also what I'm going to be speaking a lot about today. Uh, and so if you uh, sign up for the lab, you'll get access to our 27 and, uh, and 127 qubit devices, and you'll have a guided uh, tutorial on how to use these capabilities, uh, introducing them. So please feel free to give that a, a shot. Uh, and, and there's a link right here. Or if you search Spring Challenge, it should pop up. So when I give these talks, I always like to start with our development roadmap. And the development roadmap, it's it's an external roadmap, right? But it's very much an internal tool as well because it allows externally, it allows our customers, the industry as a whole to know what IBM is targeting as one of the uh, one of the major vendors in the field of quantum computing, where we are developing to, and that allows our vendors, our customers, our, our collaborators to start to think about what they need to develop against against the timeline. But internally, we're also developing against this roadmap. Internally, when I'm planning out the work for my team, uh, we're having to plan out uh, not just what we need to do this year, but where we're going in the next two, three, four, five years. Uh, and importantly, this is a very ambitious roadmap, and there's really quick scale up that's effectively scaling up exponentially in the number of qubits. But also, there are new forms of uh, effectively capabilities that we're developing, such as chip-to-chip -chip links that are both classical, uh, quantum, and then node-based systems. One of the major features that we were delivering last year was dynamic circuits. Of course, our Osprey device as well, which is now public uh, as of, I think, two weeks ago. Maybe it was last week. I can't quite remember, uh, which is at 433 qubits, and I believe the, the largest uh, device with individually addressable qubits that, that's available publicly. And where we're heading to is Kookaburra, where this is a node-based system, and it's many, many qubits. And there are very advanced features that we currently don't support, such as chip-to-chip -chip links, long-range links, uh, as well as uh, classical links. And these are sorts of functionality or features that we will have to make sure that we're capable of addressing in the next few years. So it's very nice to have this roadmap available to us so that we can know where we are targeting because IBM Quantum is also a very large organization. There are very many development efforts underway in parallel. And this is one of the major tools we use to act as effectively a beacon for where we need to develop towards. And so this is a, another kind of intro picture I like to show because similar to what I said in the title slide, it really helps us level set. So at the very bottom, we have the dilution refrigerator, at which at the bottom at, at, at the base plate, we, we will have our actual payload. And this is the picture many of us are familiar with when we think of a superconducting quantum computer. Another place that many of us are familiar with are the, uh, the user interface, right? Programming circuits through Qiskit or whatever SDK you would choose for your vendor of choice, and then talking to them, these machines over the cloud, which is quite a common model that vendors are exposing these devices through uh, today. 
But what we're not as familiar with is the piece in the middle. So when we submit the program, what actually happens beneath the scenes to make that program run? And that's what I'm going to be speaking about today in my presentation. In particular, there are two main components that we'll cover. One is the control software. So it's the host machine that's running. I, I like to use the analogy in terms of accelerator computing. Think your GPU or your TPU. It's a special purpose processor, the quantum computer is. And we're, we're having to run a classical program that we then want to uh, manipulate through this classical CPU or server. And, and then we offload special portions of that computation to the class uh, to a special purpose processor uh, to invoke your quantum kernel in a sense. In the case, it's not a GPU kernel, a classical kernel. It's a very different type of kernel. But at the end of the day, what actually controls the quantum computer is classical. So we have racks of classical electronics that are sending signals down to the device and receiving these semi-classical signals back from the device. And in many ways, the actual QPU is just a passive device. It's a bunch of re you know, resistors, hopefully not resistors, I suppose, but inductors, capacitors, and uh, some uh, some special purpose inductors, the Josephson Junction. Uh, and it's up to the classical electronics to be the brain. And we often don't think about those classical electronics and what makes the whole thing run. And so when we think about the layers of the stack to make all of this work, we, we, we do form up the stack. Starting at the bottom, we start with the quantum device. Then we have that control hardware that orchestrates that, that passive device. The control hardware itself is made up of, and orchestrated by a lot of software. So firmware and, and, and gateware that lives in, the, in that software. Uh, in, in that control hardware story. Instrument drivers that in turn orchestrates that, that control hardware. Control software that acts as an orchestration or control plane over many different uh, independent nodes in that control system. Then to make all of that work together, we actually have to tune up that control system for, for that specific device. Currently, we're in the era where qubits especially in superconducting qubits, are not fungible. No two qubits are, are unique, even in, in a, a platform that's guaranteed to be unique at the qubit level by nature, such as, say, ion traps or neutral atoms. We still deal with very heterogeneous uh, uh, control infrastructure and a lot of variation in that control infrastructure that needs to be calibrated. And then finally, above all of that, we can start to expose a singular quantum device that we can use for application purposes. And so I've tried to highlight the area that I work most in. So, so basically I, I concentrate on the quantum, uh, the, the control software, the kind of the driver layer, and then I leak into the computer architecture and the calibration. Uh, so, so it's nice to have a stack though, because a stack is you start to formalize interface layers. It allows you to start to only reason about the interface above you and the interface below you. And this is really important in quantum computing or just in software engineering and engineering in general, because these systems are very complex and it's getting to the point where no one person can keep the entire system in their mind. And so you need to start to formalize well-defined interfaces to allow people to work within one area and then know what the contract is between them, uh, you know, above and below. And so today I'm going to walk through kind of, we'll start at the bottom and we'll make our way up is what I want to do today. And so we're going to start with the quantum device now. And you know what, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but if you have questions, it's a small audience, feel free to just interrupt me. You can type them in the chat, but I also don't mind any questions at all throughout my presentation. Uh, and so we'll start at the bottom today, uh, today at the qubit device layer. We'll go through this relatively quickly. Uh, but let's talk qubits. So we're still using transmon qubits at IBM. We've been using them since the very first device that we put out on the IBM quantum experience. And at the individual qubit level from a parameter aspect, not much has changed in the sense that our qubits still have a zero one transition of around five gigahertz. And we have an anharmonicity of around 330 megahertz. They have increased in coherence times by several orders of magnitude, but this can be attributed not to fundamental design changes in the structure of the qubit, 
but more so design changes in, in packaging and fabrication, et cetera, that is allowed to really push this qubit technology. And we really haven't run into an upper bound yet. On the other hand, on, in the coupler, in the realm of couplers, we have been doing a bit more R and D here. So most devices that we are currently uh, providing over the IBM Quantum Experience are based off the cross resonance gate. So these qubits are coupled via a fixed frequency resonator. And what's really nice about the cross resonance gate is we can achieve relatively high fidelity two qubit interactions but these don't require additional control lines. So we're able to use the same drive line that we use for the qubits to drive this uh, effective two qubit interaction through the resonator. But we're also now moving our devices in future generations of our hardware, uh, starting with our Heron device this year to a flux tunable coupler architecture. And this is going to allow us to achieve higher fidelity gates and, and much quicker gates as well, two qubit gates. At the readout side, we're doing a dispersive readout through a separate measurement resonator uh, that's around seven gigahertz. In terms of actual functionality, it's important to keep in mind that we also have some very interesting properties of the system we're building on that roadmap. So we're building out a system that will not be uh, quantum connected in a quantum sense. So there will not be gates that allow us to couple these disjoint chips here, they're, they're going to have disjoint coupling maps, but they will be coupled through a classical control system that will enable us to potentially do circuit knitting to reduce the, uh, to, to make an effectively larger device through uh, a classical sampling overhead. So this is one device we're pursuing this year. We are also pursuing chip to chip links. So this will allow us to resolve this issue of a lack of, um, of quantum coupling between these chips. And then we're moving towards modular based systems as well with our system two infrastructure uh, that we're starting to build out. So as we move past the quantum domain into the uh, control system and, and control software domain, let's talk about the requirements for controlling these qubits. So for superconducting qubits, there's, there's really no optical components. It's mostly microwave and DC control, uh, which is very nice from a, a system reliability and deployment and maintenance uh, point of view. So what we have to uh, do is for control, we send down RF signals uh, for single qubit control. Uh, and so these are around four to six gigahertz. We, we do readout around six to eight gigahertz and we require an instantaneous bandwidth or at least we target of around 750 megahertz. The resolution on amplitude control, uh, ideally we shoot for 14, big, uh, 14 bits. Uh, as we go to lower temperatures, uh, the, the Johnson Nyquist noise becomes uh, less of a problem. So, so resolution uh, is potentially less of a problem as well. As uh, we, we shoot, shoot for uh, minus 140 dBm per hertz of noise, uh, and the signals at four to six gigahertz, we can either mix these signal, signals up from baseband, so we can have a, an extra LO, an analog LO that we mix uh, the our we, we sideband to achieve the exact qubit frequency we want for the transition of interest, or we can look at direct drive synthesis, which is what we're doing with our latest generation of control systems. Uh, we're also looking for very low amplitude drift. So drift is really important because we can tolerate error in, in the control, the target voltages, because those get calibrated away. But drift is going to be stochastic and the calibrations in turn will drift. Uh, so, so drift can be a bit of a problem. And so drift can be caused by temperature and power supply drift typically in our systems. Now, as we're moving to these flux tunable couplers, we now have DC control lines and DC comes with a whole host of new problems and signal dispersion, et cetera, that uh, uh, we, we have to engineer around into our control systems and into the wiring of the systems, et cetera. We also have pumps for our tupas around eight to nine gigahertz that we have to, to supply. And then finally, the signals that we send down for readout, we also have to capture. So we also have ADCs that uh, sample at around 68 gigahertz. 
uh, to actually take in those signals and then apply discriminator in hardware to say whether this was a zero or a one. Then in terms of not just specifications, but in control requirements, as you saw from the roadmap, we're going to 4,000 qubits uh, in three years or so. If we think about this from a resource estimation point of view, this means that right now we have one readout line per qubit uh, so, sorry, for control, we have one readout control line we need to send down, one uh, control line that we send down to actually send those RF pulses. And then on the receive side, to read out that captured signal from the measurement pulse, we have a multiplex readout. So we, we can measure up to eight qubits in, in one card, one line. On the uh, DC uh, front, when we're starting to work towards these flux, gate, uh, flux couplers, we have with the heavy heavy hex architecture there will be on average one and a half couplers per qubit and so if we add all of this together this we're looking at around two and a half lines per qubit and importantly this is scaling with the number of qubits so there's a, a an o of n scaling here which is concerning because the number of qubits is scaling exponentially so so this is something that really is on our radar and so anything that might be coupled linearly to uh, the, the number of control lines is also going to grow exponentially as you scale up these systems, such as cost or, or uh, even floor space in a data center, which I, I guess can scale uh, quadratically if you think of it in terms of area. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is availability. As you scale up the number of individual elements in the control system, any one element has a, a percentage of failure, right? But if you start to scale up the number of elements exponentially, well, then you're going to have all those percentages of failure are going to start to multiple, multiply together, and you're going to have a very low probability of successfully maintaining the system for a long period of time. So this is something we pay very close attention to. And another control requirement that we, we keep in mind is we're really starting to work towards error correction in the next few years. And so this requires the ability to act back on our qubits in real time. And so this is what we call dynamic circuits. So looking at our control systems today, we actually have had several generations. So I guess not today, but over the, the history of IBM Quantum, which even in such a relatively short history, we've had several generations of custom control electronics. Starting off with the first, a few IBM quantum systems and the the 20 kind of 18 to 2019 uh, time frame. We had our first generation control systems where we had 20 qubits per control rack. So this is a standard data center rack. Moving into generation two, which is what most of the control systems are using, uh, most of the devices are using today that are exposed through uh, the IBM uh, quantum experience. Uh, these could handle up to 84 qubits per rack. And generation three is the latest generation that we've just started to uh, roll out. So Osprey is using generation three control electronics. And so now we're able to pack up to a thousand, a thousand uh, control electronics to control up to a thousand qubits into a single rack. So we've really been driving density very hard and, and also cost as well. So the cost per qubit. But as we start to look even further into the future, we're going to encounter problems in, in actually getting those signals down into the fridge. We're going to have wiring density issues. We're going to have, to have heat load issues. And so one pathway we're also pursuing is cryogenic control. So here we're pursuing cryo CMOS. Uh, and of course, cryo CMOS comes with its own host of issues in terms of uh, its, its heat load that it will add. So this will be down at the 4K plate. But the benefit of this is we can replace many analog lines into the fridge with only a few digital lines as well as power lines into the cryo CMOS controller. Uh, and then from the 4K to the, the uh, 15 millikelvin stage, we, we, can, uh, we can wire uh, through superconducting lines. So there's been some very nice work that we've published on an initial RF controller based on a, a 14 nanometer FinFET technology. Importantly, the figure of merit that we're looking at is the 
uh, power dissipation per qubit under active control. So this is when we're actually sending pulses. Ideally, we're not dissipating much power when we're not doing anything. And so this is at around 23 milliwatts for, for uh, RF control currently. And it has similar control properties to our room temperature control systems in terms of the features that it has available to it. And we'll speak a bit more about those uh, in the next few slides. And like I mentioned a slide or two ago, we get away with we can get away with uh, lower resolution, which is important because the more resolution, the faster the clock rate we have in these controllers, the more energy we're going to burn. And so we we have to deal with a, a, a slower clock rate here. So what does this control system architecture actually look like? So this is a very heterogeneous architecture. It's based on a hierarchical system of FPGAs and potentially cryo CMOS controllers down the road. And in this system, it's heterogeneous in the sense that there are different types of computing elements or control system elements within this, this tree of hardware. So at the very top, we have a central controller or multiple central controllers, which you can think of as the brain in the system. So these are currently classical purpose uh, classical CPUs that have special uh, purpose extensions to receive the results of measurements from all of the special purpose controllers that we'll talk about in a little bit. These are cu coupled through a, very, a special purpose network with very low latency links to our local controllers in the system, which in turn, and when I say local controllers, you can think of the qubit uh, actuation nodes and capture nodes. So, so these actuation nodes are going to be for D DC and RF control. And so these have a special purpose processor that enables fully real-time control over the waveforms that we need to generate to send out to the uh, actual QPU, as well as there are versions that are for capture. So they receive the waveforms that come back and, and sample them with an ADC and then discriminate the results on the fly and uh, distribute these results up to the, the central controller. And so in this way, we form a closed loop where we can decide on what we're going to do next. We can actuate on the qubits, we can measure the results, and then we can send that back up to decide what we want to do next. And all of this needs to be done within several, uh, within a fractions of the coherence time of our qubits, which right now for our systems, we maybe sit around say two or 300 uh, microseconds uh, T2 time. And so this means we, we have to do this in hundreds of nanoseconds instead. So this is a very uh, rapid and distributed uh, control flow. And the way that this all works is, uh, is how do we synchronize these events? Well, in the control system, we share a global clock. So we have a shared notion of time and we can start to plan out what events we're going to do on what time on the overall timeline. I, the way I like to think about it, it's, it's like if we're planning a heist, you know, think Ocean's Eleven. Before we start the heist, we're going to synchronize time. And then in parallel, we can start to plan the events that we're going to do. But if the time, if we if we set our clocks wrong, well, somebody's going to try and say break into the security system at the wrong time, and we're not going to have enough time to do what we need to do over here. And the whole thing's going to fall apart. And so critically, we're we're all relying on these synchronized clocks that that are hardware enabled. And so as we start to think in the long term, I'd, I'd like to pose these kind of questions that we're thinking about. How do we continue to scale these decision networks right now that are based on centralized control to the execution of large scale dynamic circuits? I'm not talking about a few hundred qubits. I'm talking about tens of thousands of qubits for a quantum error correction. You can't have centralized control because if you have to make a decision on every single qubit and then, you know, if else, if else, and go through all of those qubits, it's just going to take too long. So how do we make the programming and the control systems and decisions more concurrent? And then another thing that's on our minds is, does cryo control make sense for superconducting qubits? Do the do the requirements for power dissipation for for uh, that that for the uh, heat uh, the cooling capacity we have available in our fridge? align with the requirements for the, the cryo uh, CMOS controller uh, 
and do, kind of do these mesh or, or is there going to be a problem there? The cryo CMOS controller takes too much uh, power, for example, is one problem, dissipates too much heat. Maybe the it, the wiring, saving on the wiring isn't as big of an issue. These are things that we're, we're really thinking about. And so now that we've gone through the uh, kind of the computer architecture, before I move on to software, are there any questions? Hi, Thomas. Uh, I have a question about like the cryo CMOS. So sure. will this be like some sort of reconfigurable chip or is it just ASIC? Like, I guess the reason is I ask is that uh, like currently, like as you show in, in the other graph, like you use FPGAs. And I, I guess there's a reason for it because you can mm -hmm. change things around and you have some flexibility. Yeah. Yeah, so so that's it. It will definitely be an ASIC, right? And it will be a programmable ASIC in the sense that they will have little special purpose processors down in the uh, in that cryo CMOS computing element, so we can program individual user programs there, right? In the same way that we program these local processors for the circuit that that you want to execute. We'll speak a bit more about how that works in a few slides down the road. But one of the very nice properties that we all love FPGAs for is that if we make a bug or we need to add a new feature, then it's very easy to do. We just flash the gateway, right? Sure, we have to handle a release, reflashing the gateway, recalibrating, but that's relatively minor compared to the cycle time for, for actually fabricating, uh, going to RIP for, for a, uh, a cryo CMOS controller. So one it is very much a concern that we have when we're thinking about fabricating and building these devices. So we really take the strategy that we, we build in risk tolerance uh, or risk mitigation early on in the design phase and in the capabilities that we're building into these first generation cryo CMOS controllers. So if we think there's a capability that we'll need, we try and implement it uh, now before we move on to, uh, instead of say trying to minimize uh the the uh the power dissipation on the chip it's better to mitigate the risk at this current stage but i we still are not going to be able to kind of achieve the reconfigurability that we can achieve with an fpga okay got it. thanks yeah. no problem. hi thomas yeah. yeah i want to ask uh if we want to transfer a large value of data, classical data, from a classical domain to the quantum domain. Uh, do you know what is the bandwidth of the currently quantum control system? And what will be the peak peak bandwidth of such system? So there's different types of classical data that can be we can consider transmitting and there's different layers in which this data will be transmitted. I can't comment on the the current bandwidths of our control systems. This is proprietary right now. But I will comment on the different time scales that are involved in those in in that transmission. Um, it's very important to consider this as we're looking at quantum error correction, for example within the system itself. Uh, uh, so this is what I would call like the live value data. So these are values that are being computed on the fly based from uh, on measurement results. But the other form of data that is often, that that we could also kind of, that, that your question could kind of bring to mind is for variational type algorithms or, or machine learning type algorithms, you have to encode classical data ahead of time. Uh, into the overall programs. And, and this has kind of different implications in terms of uh, building that data into the binaries that are going to be loaded into these machines. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure, I, I know that doesn't give you an answer, but it's something that we definitely are analyzing internally. Okay, thank you. And one more question. How fast yep. over one data from a classical domain to like a one bit? from classical domain to the content domain to the qubit, how fast that, what is the latency of that could be? So, so I, I would take that to mean what is the, uh, ba basically the duration from measuring here. So, so I, I, I need to measure 
and then this measurement result needs to be transferred here. And then this, this result needs to come back uh, to, to influence a gate on the next, uh, to influence the next gate that we're going to apply. Is, is that what you're asking? Uh, yes. Okay, so, so right now, if we disregard the measurement pulse, which in See? its own right is going to take about four to 500 nanoseconds, this so, uh, derate, yep. Yeah, uh, th this uh, th sorry, this dura <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, th this duration is going to be around uh, around 500 nanoseconds right now uh, to to the the time to apply the next gate to decide what gate to apply. Uh, and there are some developments that we're working on and should be rolling out later this year that will drive this down uh, a, a little bit more by another few hundred maybe another 100, 200 nanoseconds, but there ultimately are some uh, relatively hard limits based on the physical di uh, the physical distances between these uh, uh, heterogeneous controllers will place hard limits, especially as we scale up these systems to larger sizes like uh, this, the physical latency increases even more and there might be point to point hops and that, that will drive even higher latency depending on the overall topology and how closely the qubits are connected. So these these all need to be taken into account when compiling. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, so in, in terms of this, uh, let's kind of dive into the different types of programs we'll be actually running. Uh, so we have model developers, algorithm developers, uh, I'm not going to focus on these, but uh, kernel developers is what I think in terms of the people that are running pro writing programs that are going to be run directly on the devices and need to have a, a relatively high degree of knowledge about the underlying quantum hardware they're running on to make sure the programs run efficiently. Uh, I think the analogy would be, say, if I'm writing a GPU kernel, uh, like physically at the, say, OpenCL or CUDA level, it's really important to know kind of the underlying computer architecture to, to maximize throughput through that device. Uh, and modern computer architectures for quantum computers, if you, as you've seen, they're kind of scaling out in terms of complexity. They're not scaling down yet. And so they're relatively complex beasts. And the other piece uh, to, to, your, to your question before is that real workloads are not purely quantum, but they require an interaction between quantum and classical computer res resources. This can be on multiple time scales uh, in terms of uh, a quantum, uh, writing a, a a quantum program, running that quantum program, getting that data back to a general purpose CPU or a special purpose classical CPU, making a high, uh, a, a relatively long latency in terms of the order of the qubits decision, and then getting this, and then choosing the next program to run based on that information, or having to make a decision within the coherence time of the qubits. So, so this might, the, the latter might be say VQV or, or some mitigation techniques or, or, uh, quantum machine learning, but really over here, dynamic circuits, this is where we're, we're starting to talk about the regime of what can we do with, uh, with fast local, uh, uh, local classical control next to the qubits. And so this is really a, a key requirement for quantum error correction, but it's also uh, a, a requirement for, for many other algorithms that we're considering, such as circuit knitting or uh, gate teleportation, uh, et cetera. Um, so, so really this takes us from the, so, so the goal of dynamic circuits was to go from this regime where we have these static circuits, where we know the sequences of waveforms we need to run a priori, to really trying to uh, run a sequence of waveforms, uh, measure the, the outputs, choose what sequence of waveforms we're going to run next and do this all within the lifetime of the qubits. And so one of the first things that we did before we set out on this effort was to figure out how we were going to express this, not to not just to Kiskate users, but also to our organization about what are the requirements for, uh, for control that we need to start building, because it really was kind of a pivotal shift in our approach to control electronics and, and the uh, quantum circuits we were going to run. So we work towards a, a textual extension, a textual language that's an extension of OpenCASM 2, which is OpenCASM 3. Um, 
so it's really in, in many ways it, it's kind of like c surrounding open chasm 2 but importantly it provides uh support for real-time control so in conditional executions repeated executions etc so think for while loops etc so we can do branching where we're going to branch based on some decision we measure in, in runtime uh, and then conditionally execute sequences of operations. We can do loops, uh, for looping, et cetera, repeat until success out type algorithms. And so really this was this is a language that helps us communicate the requirements for the control to uh, our software developers, our control system architects, et cetera. Uh, so, so it's quite a flexible language. Support for it is now built into Qiskit. Uh, so you can input it, uh, so read in Open Chasm 3 and then output circuits to Open Chasm 3, as well as you can submit Open Chasm 3 directly to our hardware uh, to be executed. But I now want to kind of, you know, pose a question, right? So, so this comes back to my initial uh, uh, point about this is often the hidden layer. So many of us might have used the Qiskit Runtime or Qiskit Terra. But my question would be, how do you actually use, how, how, what makes the Qiskit runtime work? How does the Qiskit runtime, when you say backend.run, talk to the hardware? How does the hardware, how does it make the hardware run the actual quantum program? How do we manage this hardware? And then how does a network of control electronics become a quantum computer, right? This is very heterogeneous uh, infrastructure. Uh, each individual com component plays a small role in the overall picture. And so something needs to do orchestration here, right? And that's what we do down here at this control software. And so looking at our, our overall computer architecture in an abstract sense, we have some control elements. So we have waveform ge generators, we have digitizers, and these send signals and they receive signals. And then we have a central controller that sends decisions, which also can be viewed as signals, uh, and receives uh, uh, the results of, of decisions at the qubit discrimination level. And so this, these decisions are slower currently because they're based on a, a classical CPU. But we also have the ability for faster local decisions between, say, our capture and our uh, our control elements in the overall control system. So how do we orchestrate all of this, these individual components to act as a collective quantum computer? Uh, and, and so this is just an example of a fast path we support within the, the control system for a conditional reset. So this is like a very heterogeneous operation. So, so not only do we have to handle this general control flow, we might also need to exploit different pathways in the control system. And our software needs to be able to reason about this at scale for multiple generations of, of control electronics. Um, so as we're looking towards, uh, from, from this point of view, what we're actually trying to do is take all of this, uh, these control electronics and schedule events on a timeline. So playing a waveform is an event capturing uh, a qubit, uh, that the result of a waveform, a measurement waveform is an event. And so the goal of the software layer is to schedule all of these events for this heterogeneous control system, given the tools that are available to it, uh, to actually form an executable that we can run, or in our case, many executables, it's like a fat binary on all of the control system elements, uh, given the underlying information about how that control system is set up, because every quantum computer is also different. That's the other piece that we're dealing with. So it's a very reconfigurable system. Uh, and so that is where uh, software comes in currently. And so as we're thinking about these control systems and the control software for these control systems, I'd like to make some kind of concrete statements. So one, modern quantum computers are con constructed from many heterogeneous components. This applies to almost all quantum systems that I know of, whether they're superconducting qubits, ion traps, neutral atoms, et cetera. For quantum error correction, we require low latency classical quantum interactions uh, in, in real time uh, to, do, to do universal, uh, uh, to have a universal gate set. We have uh, concurrence real time programming deadlines as a result of this in the overall control system, the qubits define our clocks. So in one way you can think of our, our, I mentioned we have a clock in our individual control systems. 
but the qubits themselves are little clocks as well. So we need to synchronize our clocks to those clocks. And if we lose track of the state of the qubit clocks, then we it's effectively, we it's like a frame slip and we're, and we're randomizing that frame. And this is, this is error and it's really bad error. Currently we have linear and qubit control scaling requirements and the qubits are growing exponentially. And this means since this, these so systems are orchestrated through software, we also have exponentially growing software requirements as the qubits grow exponentially, right? It's linear, of course, in the, in the overall qubits, but the qubits are growing really quickly. And then what we need to do is orchestrate all of this, all of these control system elements that are purely classical to expose a quantum device. So this is what I like to call software-defined infrastructure. So, so software-defined infrastructure is a very common technique, say, in, in uh, software-defined radio, in, in, in cloud computing, et cetera. This applies to current control systems for quantum computing as well. And so we can take some ideas from there. And so when we, when we have to run the software-defined infrastructure, the stages that we need to go through, right? We need to take the, the user's expression of a program uh, at the qubit level, which the control systems do not think in terms of qubits. They think in terms of events that we need to emit. Um, we need to decompose this given calibration information and schedule these operations down to the underlying events in this distributed hardware. And then we need to build up binaries that actually can make that happen in the hardware for each individual user program uh, that will allow us to execute that the user specified program at this high level at the abstract form circuit level. And that's what it takes to actually uh, compile a program uh, to run on the hardware. Uh, and so in the overall, you know, in the overall point of view of exposing these devices over to the end user, the uh, end user is over here in what I call user space. And then over in kernel space, this is behind the IBM firewall, we have this near time execution layer, which allows us to launch uh, independent containers that use the quantum computer, where you can write arbitrary programs very near the device with a relatively low latency link to the device. And I, I mean, it's still a network link. There's still overhead on the time of, uh, of, of seconds to launching these, or hundreds of milliseconds to launching these containers and setup, et cetera. But it's a relatively a low latency link in terms of the, it's not physically very distant from where this computation is happening over on this side. Uh, and then we're able to submit programs to the actual device, which really is in the controller machine. This is everything behind the, the um, IBM firewall and all of this, these components are localized to control a specific hardware machine. And this is how we enable multiple tenancy. There can be multiple, multiple uh, containers trying to talk to the same quantum device, but we manage that quantum device so that only a given user has access to it at, a, at any one point in time. And we do this through a compute framework uh, um, that we're building out that's similar to, say, uh, OpenCL or CUDA in the long run, where you expose this, uh, this device to the end user uh, with the capabilities to, say, compile or run a program. And behind the scenes, there is a compiler for this heterogeneous control system architecture that is extensible for the different generations of hardware we have. It can consume CASM3, then decompose a program to these heterogeneous control systems to actually run and produce a binary, which in turn is fed back uh, to be launched by our quantum OS is what we call it, which manages all of the quantum hardware and actually manages loading these binaries into the hardware through device drivers, which eventually get loaded into the right uh, uh, hardware computing elements, and then we orchestrate a runtime across these collective uh, elements in the system. And so this is another view of this, right, where we have the Kiskit runtime, it's talking over the network to the overall, uh, this should say, framework, uh, which uh, has a code generation element and an execution element, which in turn talks to the hardware. This code generation, we can only do with configuration information about the overall system that we're targeting at this given point it's reconfigurable and we have to do this with uh uh an understanding of the the domains uh, the time domains and the capabilities that are available to us within the different domains so within the real time domain this is where dynamic circuits really lives where we're trying to to run different sorts of algorithms like quantum error correction or teleportation 
uh, within the lifetime of the qubits. And then in the near time domain, we can start to bake behind the scenes calibration experiments, et cetera, that still requires, say, reloading or slower operations than the qubit coherence time, but much faster than, say, can be uh, exposed to the uh, directly to the end user and much more specific to the devices. And then ultimately, the end user is submitting programs through this uh, containerized environment over the network that is co-localized or co-located -loc with the uh, control systems and the overall device. And that's the Qiskit runtime. And so in terms of decision latency, uh, in the real-time layer, we're looking at hundreds of, of nanoseconds. In the near-time layer, we're looking at greater than 500 milliseconds to seconds. So this is directly within this quantum computing framework within the quantum OS. And then as we go to the near-time layer, you can expect latencies on the order of seconds currently. Uh, and let's dive down into the how we actually generate this code. So we have a special purpose compiler uh, that is built on top of MLIR and the LLVM infrastructure that can consume both input OpenCASM3 and MLIR. And we built out several dialects within the MLIR, which is known as the multi-level intermediate representation for representing OpenCASM3, our quantum IR known as Quire. We have a pulse level IR. We have an uh, uh, an IR for representing the capabilities of abstracted quantum computing systems. And then we're able to reuse representations for say structure control flow off the shelf through MLIR's uh, uh, dialects that they make available to all users. We also have a targeting infrastructure where we're able to plug in targets for different control systems such as our second or third generation control systems so that we know exactly the systems that we're targeting with that input configuration information and we can build binaries for those systems so you can think of it as like a cross compiler in a sense uh, and this is where these vendor extensions come in so this is a pluggable interface and then finally we have a payload packager that produces a payload that can be loaded by that quantum os so it's not sufficient to just compile, you also have to run. They're kind of like duels of one another. And so the way we do this compilation is we, we say take an input single source program. So this is some, I'm not sure this is actually OpenCASM 3. It should be, I hope. Um, and what we do is here, we, we need to uh, express some external calculation that we wrote, say, in a classical language. We want to invoke this remote function. We want to measure some qubits. Uh, and then we want to accumulate the results of those measurements and store them into some register that we then want to evoke this classical function on to compute a decision value that we want then want to conditionally apply a gate to. And in, in a single source format like this, this is a very simple program. But based on what I've said earlier about the computer system, the control system architecture, it's a very heterogeneous architecture. So we need to break out the components of this program to the relevant controllers to orchestrate the collective program from the individual components. And so we call this phase localization. And what we do is we localize the code to the individual uh, computer elements. For example, for the central controller, it only needs to, to know how to apply the parity function. It needs to know how to receive messages at specific times that will be uh, sent from the qubit controllers and then needs to know how to evaluate the parity function on those qubit on on those results, and finally distribute the next decision to the other qubit controllers in the system. Uh, and then in terms, of the qubit controllers they only worry about say doing a, me a measurement or sending the result of that measurement, and then receiving the next decision value. And by doing this, we can really minimize the bandwidth that we need within this overall communication network. We don't communicate all values to everywhere. It's a very sparse connectivity, and we really only communicate through this network the information required to uh, to make the decision at a, at a collective level, uh, which basically comes down to the decision of do we take this branch or don't take this branch in this case, and the time at which to do this. Because importantly, we I mentioned we all share a global clock. If we don't do it all at the same time, then we're going to desynchronize our clocks and the program is not going to do what we expected at the quantum level the, the, or the, the quantum control level. And so this is another picture of this compiler interface uh, where we really kind of show the stages of compilation. So we accept some input source file 
uh, into the compiler, we also accept a target system configuration where there's a hierarchical tree representation of the target system. So it's a target of targets that we need to compile for. And each of these components is fully pluggable. Uh, and we need to go through several phases of compilation like uh, open chasm three parsing, analysis and optimization, localization to controllers for our specific target. So these are all pluggable passes that's fully programmable based on the hardware we're targeting. And then we finally do module specific optimization. So what we mean here is we, we localize the code eventually to only the code that needs to be uh, compiled for this instrument in the overall system. And finally, we package this all up into one shared payload that represents the program to be executed. Uh, and so we use MLIR, I mentioned. Uh, I'm going to skip the slide because we're running out of time, but I'm happy to accept questions here. Uh, I have a quick example of how we actually do compilation, but I'm also going to quickly go through this. Suffice it to say, I can come back to this if there are questions. There are several stages, such as uh, reading this MLIR, uh, extracting the circuits, uh, lowering lowering those circuits to pulses that we need to emit through calibrations, and then localizing the code to the relevant controllers, like I mentioned, and then finally building uh, the overall binaries that can actually be built in the hardware. In some cases, we use LLVM to do that for specific controllers, and then packaging this all up into one shared payload that contains all the binaries for all of the inf instruments, metadata, configuration information, etc. Uh, and so then once we produce that payload, we need to launch this into our, our quantum OS, uh, which provides a runtime. And then the quantum OS provides for the individual instruments. It provides a persistent connection to that hardware. It allows us to do state management, resource management, system configuration, scheduling, partitioning of the devices, and then access management. And it, it talks to an abstracted uh, hardware representation, a hardware abstraction layer. And then this is also extensible. So we have extensible targets in the controller and extensible uh, targets in our uh, runtime as well. So this allows us to, to really be ready for the different generations of hardware that are coming both internal and external. And so this is a high level point of view of the quantum OS. So there's a few components in it, including a kernel element. Uh, and then there's a hardware hypervisor uh, and, and finally, we talk uh, remotely over the network uh, through an RPC interface to our individual instrument drivers, which then talk to the control hardware. And so ultimately, they they take that program, they split it apart that we built into these binaries and load them into the individual controllers and then orchestrate the program lifecycle uh, from the execution point of view. And uh, I'll finally just... Uh, mentioned there are a lot of challenges for the next five years. We need to drive down the cost per control and capture channel by an order of magnitude. Uh, we, we have qubit counts that are currently scaling around O of three to the N, where N is the, the year. Uh, but this means that uh, the classical control schemes, like I said, are linear with respect to qubit counts. So we have exponentially scaling uh, control requirements. Uh, we really need to drive down the wiring costs and density as well. As we're looking at cryo CMOS, power budgets are important. Uh, it's also expensive and inflexible, like we mentioned before. And wiring density is very much still a concern for cryo CMOS. And then when we're looking at real-time computing, the bandwidth requirements for quantum error correction very, really are intimidating. Uh, I think new programming models are required for heterogeneous concurrent hardware with real-time deadlines. I don't think Open Chasm 3 is uh, sufficient. It's single-threaded in that sense. And so we're looking at where we go from here. Uh, and MLIR provides us a very nice playground to explore these semantics. And then uh, how do we expose this very complex computer architecture to our end users? How do we expose the nuance without telling, you know, exactly this is how exactly how what you are saying, uh, what, what you want to do is implement it. We can't expose that because it's proprietary. And it's, it's a problem when it comes to providing a very uh, cohesive user experience and it's getting the most performance you can out of the given device. And then one more thing, I want to uh, plug this uh, paper that should be posted, I hope, tomorrow to the archive, uh, where we'll, uh, we show that we can encode magic states in our hardware with beyond break even fidelity through dynamic circuits. Uh, and this is a very cool result. Uh, and and I, I hope to keep an eye out for it, I guess.
And so with that, uh, uh, I, I, I know we're at 1230, but I also can take questions you might have.